Hi all, and welcome to the Medical AI Lab Reading Group session. Every week, a lab member covers a recent paper in either core AI or medical AI, and this is targeted to be broadly interesting to those interested in the cutting edge of AI and its applications in medicine. This week, we will have Kyle Alford presenting the paper, Data to VEC, a general framework for self-supervised learning in speech, vision, and language. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome Kyle to share this paper with us. Yeah, thanks Pranav. Um, hi everyone, my name is Kyle. I'm a junior at Columbia. And today I will be presenting data to vec It's a new approach for a framework for learning um, from a lab here at Meta AI. And um, it's just exciting. And so we can jump right into it and see what exciting ways we can probably use it. Um, just, so just to give an outline, uh, just to motivate why the group even looked into trying to um, create this framework and what challenges they were trying to solve, I'll give some motivation and background, and then I'll jump into some of the methods they used as far as training, and really this is the meat of what they were looking for and creating, and and then towards the end, I also have experiments and results that seem pretty exciting to me. And then at the end, I'll sort of wrap things up and send um, some future directions for what the lab or what other labs may use to build upon this research. So one of the main goals, um, I'm going to start out very broad and high level. One of the main goals in AI, which is to create intelligent agents is trying to get those said agents to learn closely to how humans learn. And so when you think about how humans learn, um, you know, we have our five senses as our sensors. Um, and so if I wanted to give you, for example, a task of learning what fire was and you knew human being or a caveman or something, and you just didn't know what fire was. And so given fire, um, you could use each of these sensors, say you would see um, the fire and would be able to smell the smoke or something like that you would be able to touch and then based off of this you would eventually learn that this is um, a fire and also similarly this is um, from a paper from um, Yan Likun and Emmanuel Dupo um, from a few years ago basically they were doing research on um, early infants and a few of the learning goal posts or achievements that they um, achieved and they have things like face tracking, object permanence and recognition a few months in. And um, the common thing between this and the previous example of fire um, would be this is all unsupervised. This is all learning straight from the data. And um, so that's been one thing that in machine learning and AI we've been trying to move towards um, away from supervised learning from labels and towards something more unsupervised learning straight from the data. And so that's why self-supervised learning um, was such a huge step in this was because this allows more of a learning straight from the data approach um, rather than learning from labels, like it's super strictly supervised learning. And so um, just here for an example for vision, computer vision, if you had a picture of a dog, you could augment this, say take a, a smaller patch of this, a zoomed in patch, or augmenting this, creating um, different jittering for the colors or black and white, send it through and learn representations of this, which can then be used for later downstream tasks. And so this is really um, what was motivating. And so um, as far as the limitations in this, um, when you're thinking about SSL, you think about different problems and different domains that this could be used. So this is for computer vision, this example I have here. And there are also analogous situations in speech and um, natural language processing text. And so the main limitation here for SSL as a broad ranging um, field is that each um, training process and each, uh, all of the algorithms are um, specific to that domain. So um, for example, in vision, um, you have things like using contrastive image um, loss, trying to compare um, and place similar images closer in the latent space and then um, pushing them away from different images. 
while there are um, analogous things in NLP text and um, speech processing. And so the thing is, um, or I can also give an example there for speech, you would have um, basically learning a bank of words and then using that to learn. And then for um, NLP, trying to use a sort of a fill in the blank approach um, and then trying to learn from that. And so each of these are locally focused on a domain. And so that was the, really the main motivator because if there are advances in one domain, they can't easily be applied to um, a different domain, say from text to computer vision. And so trying to really unify this into one learning structure, that's um, where the team at Meta came in. And so they introduced data to VEC, which is basically a unified um, framework for um, learning. And so here um, you can see the image below. This is essentially how it works is they take um, the input data, however that may be, whether that be um, images here, um, audio files for um, speech or text for language here, learning the representations. Um, and I'll get into specifics for that later but basically pushing that through a teacher model, a teacher transformer network, and then taking out those same images, but masking them. So here you can see uh, some sort of mask in each domain, either replacing these with um, pixels, replacing pixels, replacing um, different timestamps in the audio or replacing words with masks, pushing those through uh, into a student model, which is identical to the first the teacher model and then basically um, distilling the knowledge from the teacher model to the student. It's basically the student is learning from the representations learned here in the teacher model. And I'll get into, again, um, the specifics of the actual model, but the, what the team was trying to get into was that it's not really the models themselves that is um, special, but the framework for learning that they wanted to highlight. Right, and so now I can get into the actual methods that they were doing throughout the paper. Um, let's see. Right, so like I said before, there's nothing really special about the model itself. It's just a standard transformer network. Um, and so um, I have a picture of it here on the left. And so Throughout the presentation, I'll usually break things down as they were in the paper. So they give an example for computer vision, speech, and the text. So in computer vision, they use the typical VIT um, like um, approach for encoding the images. So that learning approach is basically encoding the images as a sequence of 16 by 16 patches. In speech that is, um, mapping a 16 kilohertz waveform to 50 hertz representations in her text that um, includes embedding the words in a distributional space as vectors or just trying to cut down into a smaller representation into tokenizing these different in, uh, inputs. And then secondly, for each, now that each one is tokenized, replacing randomly um, generated, randomly sampled portions of those tokens with mask tokens. So masking out the inputs. And um, just to give more detail on the model setup. Um, so like I mentioned before, um, for computer vision, they moved down from the patches down to um, representations. And so the masking is actually done similarly to BIT which is, um, except for them, I think they use 40% masking, whereas for the this group, they used 60% um, masking. So 60% of the original input was masked. And um, this was just randomly sampled. Um, for speech, they followed a an implementation available in FairSeq. And for this, they uniformly sampled um, from a distribution, different time steps. And so for each time step, um, they took that time step plus the subsequent nine um, additional time steps to create these um, 10 total time steps. And so in the end, that accounts for about 49% uh, masked. And then similarly um, for NLP for text, these are burnt like uniform samples. So 
um, like we saw in the lanes, they um, token or they uniformly sample 15% of the tokens and replace them with a mask broken down um, similarly to how it is broken down in BERT training. Yeah. Okay, and then this was just a picture of the BEIT encoder, just to show um, taking an input image, breaking it down into patches, and then masking right here. Um, you'll see M masking out different things into the um, input, which is then fed into the network. And um, so as far as the teacher model, so the teacher model is um, training to predict representations that are going to be used as targets for the student network to learn from um, in the self-distillation. So um, just really quickly, just trying to get through some of the model parameters. They have an exponentially moving average for the model parameters, uh, the weights, and then they have a tau learning rate, um, which also um, it starts out at a relatively high um, number and then it gradually decreases just so towards the beginning the teacher model is um, basically rapidly changing and then once it learns meaningful representations it starts slowing down and um, that doesn't affect it as much towards the end. And then here um, getting into ac the actual output of the teacher net they create this um, output by taking a few um, different portions. So as we saw before, um, and I can also go back. Ah. These blue um, portions uh, represent the top K layers of the network. And so um, that's what K represents. They take the first K layers of the student or of the teacher network and um, average the outputs for each one. And um, here A represents the output of the block, the alpha block um, at a time, the time um, T. And the hat, no, it means that this is normalized. And for each different domain, there are different normaliza normalization um, standards. I think for NLP, um, it's just um, a typical parameter less um, normalization. While for speech, because the um, there is some correlation between subsequent time steps, they use um, a different form, a different form. Um, okay, and so with that output for the teacher net, they um, calculate the loss from with the student prediction here, and. Basically, they have a hyperparameter beta, which controls whether it's a squared loss or um, L1 loss. And this isn't really anything special. It's just um, that it's less sensitive to outliers. Right, so with all of the um, gritty details about the model out of the way, um, just making up a comparison with different model standards um, for text, we have BERT, which basically the difference here is that they, well, BERT also masks the um, inputs. They say that BERT keeps the um, inputs as discrete tokens like words, subwords, or um, bytes. While this, um, for data to vec, the um, input is more continuous because they um, create representations instead. And because there is self attention used within the transformer, um, there's also contextualization for the representations um, instead of these discrete linguistic tokens. Um, for Dino uh, and BYOL, which is bootstrap your own latent, um, the difference here is they regress multiple in in layers, like I mentioned before, the top K layers and average the outputs. Um, whereas in Dino, I think they only use the single the top um, layer the last layer. And then um, in Dino and BYOL, they don't mask the prediction. There's no um, masked prediction task. And then for Hubert and wave to vec um, the main difference here is that they learn representations without quantizing the input. Um, again, so averaging it out over multiple layers. And so what's probably um, the most exciting part of this um, would be the results. 
And again, I'll break it down by domain. So for computer vision, they report a state of the art um, results compared to the previous work. And so they um, basically trained, pre trained it on um, ImageNet and um, tried to create a downstream task for predicting single labels on a similar data set and um, then evaluated by using top one accuracy. And so here you can see that down at the bottom it reports, this is a measure of accuracy. And so it reported an 84.2% accuracy, um, which outperforms every single um, um, previous work in, the, in computer vision for both VITB and VITL, um, reporting both 84.2 and 86.2 respectively. And, um, it, here's the graphical representation of that. And so you can see that um, just relative to the others, um, like I said before mentioned, um, Dino, BEIT, um, I didn't mention these two, but just looking comparatively, you can see where it um, stacks up as far as accuracy. Um, and then similarly for speech processing, um, basically they, also pre-trained pre this and the metric here was um, for different amounts of labeled data. So they have 10 minutes here through 960 hours of pre-trained labeled um, data. They tried to um, evaluate again on some form of, um, what's it called? Um, WER, which is word error per word error rate, there we go. And um, basically, so here lower is better. And so again, you see um, compared to different um, amounts of labeled data, it performs differently, but all um, still better than the previous work. So, and then here you see the largest margin is here for 10 minutes, um, about, or exactly 3% um, percent as far as um, a lower word rate, word error rate. And again, just a visual representation. And then for text for NLP models, it only outperforms Roberta, or I'm um, not sure how that would be pronounced, Roberta, um, as a baseline, which is what they used as, um, as I mentioned before, what they used as the basis for training, but then they also compared it later on for evaluation. So using um, that as the baseline and also compar comparing it to BERT, they reported a um, improved accuracy based off of the baseline, but not um, consistently for BERT. So you'll see um, here again, it's um, an evaluation of accuracy. Um, or actually for here, it's um, a glue um, benchmark, which basically measures different things like natural language inference. Um, and I've grouped these together, um, sentence similarity, grammaticality, and sentiment analysis. And so um, again, for these, um, each one represents some sort of accuracy for the respective um, category. And so here you see that compared to the baseline, both data to VEC and then with using a wave to the VEC 2.0 like masking, it um, improves upon the baseline accuracy, but um, for a few of these, it doesn't improve upon BERT. For example, in um, the QQP sentence similarity metric, um, it's pretty similar. And for um, similar here, BERT performs better. So really, um, there's still work to be done to see if it can improve upon and create state-of-the-art um, evaluations, but it's definitely um, something promising to look at. And then here, on average, averaging all of these together, um, they report a higher overall accuracy. Ooh. And again, just um, visual representation, uh, marginal, um, very slight improvement over it, over the baseline. Um, and so they also looked into, um, again, this K metric um, hyperparameter, seeing how this affects the accuracy. And so for example, like I said, um, for BYOL, they only use the last layer in the teacher network um, as far as the output and distilling it to the student network. And so for each paradigm for speech, NLP, and vision, you can see that while only using the first layer, um, the output layer for the teacher model, 
um, by increasing the amount of layers that you move back between one to 12, um, you can actually improve in each um, metric. So decreasing in word error rate and then increasing in accuracy or blue score. And um, so they actually report that you can um, use every single layer. So for, um, in this case, 12, um, but the maximum amount, I think, I believe is eight. And so they, as you can see here, there's marginally no um, real difference, but um, computationally, it's more efficient to use eight, but it's possible to use all 12 or every single layer in whatever respective model you're using. And then they also try to look at different um, layers to actually create the targets from um, using that as the final target for the output. And so assessing this for um, word error rate only exclusively, um, looking at the self-attention layer as the, to create the targets, there was 100% error rate while they found that the um, FFN layer would perform the best at an, a word error rate of 13.1. And um, just comparing this with um, this plus a residual um, layer and then end of block, I, I would have to check again what they used for end of block. I believe it was just a, an activation layer like um, Gaussian error um, linear unit or something, some um, activation function, but that also didn't outperform just the FFN by itself. And um, just trying to, you can't really compare this to the previous um, word error rates that I showed just because there was a difference in how they trained the models. So for this, they only used 200,000 updates as opposed to 400,000 in the previous um, learning, the training um, paradigm. And so just closing things out, just to um, clarify, because this was a confusing point for me at first, they're not, there's not um, a single model um, per se, where you can input these different types of input data, like um, speech, images, and text into a single model. Um, they're saying that with each respective model learning, using a different model for each representation, once you take that, you can unify the learning um, from there. So that was um, just a point of contention that was um, confusing for a few people and myself included. But given their goal of trying to create that unified learning mechanism, um, I would say they've achieved that. And based off of this, um, you can only get closer to what I mentioned at the beginning of actually unifying and creating a single model for that. And um, right, so they are also working with a few other um, labs, um, Jagel, um, their lab, they're currently working on a similar a transformer architecture that could actually allow um, operational raw data from different modalities, like I mentioned, um, using a single model. So it's promising to see where um, we'll be in a few years. And that is the end. And I have the references for the paper, the code, and um, this is the, I guess, press release from Facebook itself. Um, there we go. And yeah, thank you. Thanks, Kyle. That was uh, great.